Good morning, everyone. It's my very great pleasure this morning to welcome all the way from the USA, one of my wonderful colleagues from the Aerospace Medical Association, Dr. Michael Hodap, to talk to us today. And I'll just read out a brief bio for you. Dr. Hodap graduated in 1991 from the University of Texas Dental Branch in Houston, Texas. From the period 1994 to 2004, he served the astronaut corps and their supporting pilots at NASA Johnson Space Center as an independent contractor. During that time, he became keenly aware of the barometrically related issues that astronauts face during their training while diving and flying in high performance aircraft. He began studying the effects of barometric changes in atmospheric pressure on the orofacial complex and over time developed an algorithm to aid in the diagnosis of these conditions. Dr. Hodap currently sees the astronaut corps in his private practice and serves as a consultant to NASA on dental planning for exploration class missions. He is a master diver and dive master and has a genuine love of flying and diving. He's also yeah. held chapters in two medical textbooks related to space flight. He's earned his mastership with the Academy of Gentle General Dentistry, achieved master status with Laser and Health Institute, and is a fellow of the Aerospace Medical Association. So thank you again very warmly for coming along today to talk to us. I've really been looking forward to it, and um, over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to welcome y'all. Uh, I'm from Houston, Texas, so I've got probably a slight twang to y'all <laughs> when I speak, but that's okay. If uh, anything gets confusing or you just need, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, you know, information, just, just ask me. I'm going to go ahead and uh, put my presentation up, share my screen with you. So what I'm going to be, uh, my topic tonight is going to be oral health considerations for space flight. With anything, our primary focus is going to be prevention. Just it's in medicine, anything you do. And the primary objectives we have is to detect pathology early, to treat dental disease effectively, of course, educate and motivate your patients, and then uh, address their cosmetic concerns. Their responsibilities, of course, is to keep examination and cleaning appointments, to follow through with the services needed, maintain good oral hygiene habits, and to minimize refined sugars. In selection and prevention, basically, there's some things where a candidate can be rejected. There's maxillofacial uh, defects that can reject them. Uh, one is any kind of defect where it prevents the uh, seal of an oxygen mask. Also, anything that can affect speech, mastication, and airway. Also, active TM disorders where they're having headaches and so forth and, and uh, deterioration of the jaws can be, be a rejection factor. Dental defects, if they have a lot of caries and periodontal disease, that all has to be corrected prior to. Any type of severe mal uh, malocclusion uh, can prevent them from uh, becoming an astronaut. And that has to do with, you know, again, speech and mastication, anything of that sort. Also, removable prosthesis, if it were to be lost in flight or something, they do not want to have a case where they can't masticate or effectively communicate. So during our dental exam, and this is during selection and just regular exams, we do a complete health history and dental history, blood pressure, pulse, respiration, an oral cancer screening, dental charting, periodontal exam, and a radiographic evaluation. And something new we've added to this is a near-infrared translumination. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. If we see anything suspicious, we'll go through a series of pulp tests uh, just to make sure there's no dental disease there that would need to be needs to be treated. So we used to do a panoramic examination along with uh, four bite wings, but we've recently switched over to ultra low dose 3Ds. And the reason for this, we can detect so much more. We can look at their airway and in fact, uh, check it volumetrically. We can look at the sinuses and so forth and, and look for any other pathology. This is just a comparison of the uh, dosage you get with a pan standard panoramic, which is usually about 24 to 48 uh, microsieverts. And then uh, with the uh, and then with the uh, ultra low dose, you can get it down to as low as about eleven, depending on what you want to want to do. And, and for us, it's usually about eleven microsieverts to anywhere to forty. But what's really nice about this, you can evaluate for any kind of temporomandibular disease. You know, if any pathology there. You can check the sinuses. You can check the ostium of the sinuses to make sure they're patent. Check for deviated septums. Check their airway, as I mentioned before. Apical pathology, any osseous pathology, and also potential complications for flight, which I'll show you here in just a minute. Now, this is a particular case where a patient had been treated with a root canal four years prior. 
and came back and were symptomatic. And so took a 3D image and were able to slice through. And as you can see there where the arrow is, we're missing a canal right here. And so I had to send them back to the endodontist and have them retreat that root canal and, and make sure that canal was treated. I'll, this is the bite wing and periapical radiography we used to check for more detail. And you can see here, this was a case where a patient decided to do nighttime cough drop use. She had a, a small cough in, in there and when she tried to fall asleep and with the cough drop use, she ended up with a lot of significant caries. She had caries on all these teeth, but you can't really see it behind these uh, metal restorations. And then also we look for things that could be potential issues in space flight. Say if they had to extract a tooth, angled roots like this could be a potential complication. And this is the uh, near-infrared transilluminator. This is a small handheld device, USB plug and play, and you can detect caries around existing restorations. It's one of the primary features of this uh, instrument. Nice thing is the porous lesions absorb light just like x-rays do, and they appear dark, so it's very easy to read. And the software will place the bite wing images up side by side for comparison. So here's an example here. We're going to look at the lower left first molar. And as you can see, there's really no sign of decay. Normally, we detect decay here in approximately. We also will detect decay sometimes around a restoration or about here. But there is no sign of any kind of caries here. But then with near-infrared transillumination, this comes from above. It bathes the tooth in the near-infrared light. And then the infrared camera picks it up. And as you can see, there's this is the, the uh, restoration. And all around here, this dark lesion and along this crack line is all caries. And so this tooth needs to be treated. And so once the decay is removed uh, and the restoration, we can see there's a crack here on the distal. And this tooth is going to need a crown as well. This is another example. Uh, standard radiographs usually will show caries in approximately, usually forms as a diamond shape coming in the enamel and then spreads out once it hits a dentin. And the near infrared transilluminator just basically confirms caries in this case. However, in the image down below, you'll notice that there is no sign of any caries here in approximately. And so if we took a near-infrared transillumination image, we can see there clearly is decay. Now, this is either the reason for it not showing up on the radiograph is either due to fluorosis or they had blurred the image when they moved when they were taking the image. For dental selection and exams, we classify all our astronauts, just like you do in the military, on a standard classification system. It's uh, based on one through four. And this is uh, over a 12-month period is the way this is classified. So class one is basically someone that is in good oral health. There's no nothing to worry about for a good 12-month period. A class two patient is one that has minor oral complications that will not present any kind of emergent issues during a 12-month period. Class three is somebody that they definitely need treatment and we need to get them back in. And then class four is just somebody that's overdue for their examination process. Active astronauts uh, will go on to get their teeth clean that same day. And then also the, the front desk uh, person will uh, schedule any kind of additional treatment or referrals with their scheduler. So all crew members to fly have to be class two or above. Anybody that wants to fly on ISS has to be in a class one status to get on board. I'm going to take you back in time. As you know, the, U the U.S. was in a space race with Russia. Russia clearly beat the U.S. In the, to, into space and, and beat the world into space, actually. And uh, anyways, in fact, they sent uh, Yuri Gagarin on the first manned orbital flight. We didn't even have a rocket that get, could get somebody into orbit at the time. And so they were just way, way ahead of everybody. Anyways, John Kennedy knew history. And he knew that when the Romans had control of the roads, they had power. And he knew when the English had control of the seas, they had power. And of course, he was concerned with the Russians having control of the heavens. So he was a little concerned there. And so he sent our nation on a uh, mission to, before this decade is out to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. It was the only way he knew we had a chance of possibly catching up and so forth. And he just wanted to get our, you know, kind of kick our nation in the gear, you know, to uh, get our rocket system up, more updated and so forth. So to get to the moon, there were three basic phases. Mercury was a single man capsule, and this was basically to understand the human aspects of spaceflight. We did not know at the time whether a man could eat, breathe, or perform bodily functions in spaceflight. In fact, there was a rumor that if a man left the, the, 
the uh, bounds of gravity that they immediately would go insane once they got into space. Well, we all know that's not true. Gemini was to master the performance aspects of spaceflight, and we had to learn how to walk in space, to rendezvous in space, and also to dock with another spacecraft in order to be able to get to the moon. And that's what Gemini was all about, just to man master the performance aspects. And finally, uh, Apollo was to put boots on the moon and return them safely to Earth. So dentistry's role during the Mercury Project was strictly prevention. I mean, the longest flight was only 34 hours. There's really not much else you had to do. And during the Gemini Project, the flights were increasing in length up to two weeks. And so all they did was add a, a toothbrush on board their capsules. Now, although during the Mercury and Gemini program, there were no in-flight dental incidences, there is a report of at least one non-vital tooth flown on three separate occasions. Now, here's the kicker. If you go back and look at the history of space flight, each astronaut had a maximum of two flights under their belt at that time. So that tells you there was more than one non-vital tooth flown on those uh, space flights. So they hired Bill Frommy. He's a Air Force dentist that was assigned to NASA JSC to care for the astronauts and uh, the uh, supporting pilots. He also participated in the research and uh, determining what's the best way to uh, treat uh, emergencies in spaceflight. And of course, astronauts are going to have to treat their own emergencies. There's no clinics up there. There's no <laughs> flight physicians. It's, it was strictly, especially at the time, uh, test pilots. And of course, Apollo 11 is where they landed a man on the moon and returned him safely to Earth. And this is their preventive dentistry program. They're just, you know, saying that the astronauts clean their teeth on the moon. Why can't you, you know? So again, prevention was primary. Uh, this is the Apollo uh, kit for any kind of medical emergency. And it just strictly consisted of meds. You know, you had antibiotics, NSAIDs, and that sort. Now, during Apollo, there were no in-flight dental issues. However, there was one pre-flight and one post-flight occurrence of pulp and I'm going to talk to you about pul pulpitis here in just a little bit. But in Bill Frommy's own words, coming out of biomedical results of Apollo, he was stating if either one of these cases occurred during flight, it could have affected uh, crew member performances. And both of these occurred both within 90 days of flight. And we do not like to treat anything within a three-month period prior to flight. Well, Skylab was America's uh, first space station. They had uh, three crews, one that was up there for 28 days one for 59 days and one for 84 days. And this was the first time they had provisions for in-flight dental care. And uh, it's a pretty well-designed kit, but you can see that there was some uh, uh, space flight uh, physician influence here. Uh, on, board, on this, in, inside the kit, they had a giggly saw, which you usually use to either cut a trim, tree limb off and when you're camping or to cut, a, cut off a uh, gangrenous uh, limb. And I see no, no use for this in the oral cavity. So that's more of a conversation piece, I would, I would say. But anyways, uh, they did have uh, two days of intensive hands-on dental training. Uh, this was at Lackland Air Force Base. They were trained to how to deliver anesthetic, uh, how to read radiographs, uh, use of instrumentation and uh, uh, medications, and also how to perform extractions. They also had on board a schematic to help them identify the teeth so they could communicate effectively with, with the ground. And also, if they were to lose uh, communication with ground, they had also a means of diagnosing themselves by a little schematic view they had. Of course, they always had a ground-based flight physician that, that had records with x-rays, models, and also access, access to a dental professional if they needed to be. There were four in-health studies in preparation for Skylab and one Skylab mission study that uh, went on um, 28 days prior to and 18 days after the mission and went through the mission. And the results were increased bacterial counts. There was increased, especially the streptococcal. There were increased calculus and genital inflammation. And there was increases in salivary IgA. They concluded this was diet uh, rather than flight related. And for anywhere from a one month to three month mission, this is not concerning at all. But once we get into these missions that are going to be going to Mars and so forth, where it's a three-year mission minimum, uh, that can be an indicator for additional uh, treatment and so forth. There were no in-flight dental issues during Skylab. However, six crew members did require treatment nine months prior to flight. One of them was a periapical abscess. It was a case of significant gingival inflammation and a recurrent abscess ulcer. Yuri Romanenko, a cosmonaut on his on aboard Soyuz 6 on his last 
last two weeks, he suffered ex uh, excruciating dental pain. They did not have provisions for in-flight dentistry at that time. He did take pain pills, but there was no relief. In fact, one of the frustrated flight physicians just told him, you know, take a mouthwash and keep warm because there was really nothing else they could tell him. And, and uh, it was just, it was kind of a sad case in that case, but uh, he did make it back down safely. The space shuttle's uh, kind of an interesting vehicle. It performed as a rocket on launch, as a satellite in flight, and then as a glider on the way back down. And it uh, was instrumental in performing research, 3D mapping. It's aided in the uh, ISS construction. It also was able to do uh, satellite launches and recovery. And if y'all haven't seen any images from the Chandra telescope, this is an X-ray telescope that uh, uh, actually can uh, image black holes. And then, of course, everybody's familiar with the Hubble telescope. Again, for shuttle, it was uh, uh, prevention was primary. For those of you who don't know, the Russians and Americans worked together on the uh, uh, cosmonaut space station, Mir. Uh, this was in preparation for the building of the International Space Station. And we had uh, seven missions on board. And during that time, we had two incidences of carries, and they were filled with the temporary uh, filling material, and there are no further complications. During the space shuttle, there were two pre-flight occurrences of endodontic therapy that had to be done. One occurred within two weeks of flight. Uh, the, they, uh, and during that flight, they had temporary crown dislodged, and the uh, crew members were able to uh, loot it with calcium hydroxide cement, which, which was on board, and there were no further complications. In fact, the crew members came back, and they were really excited because they got to finally do a dental procedure in space flight, and, uh, and everything worked real well. Uh, International Space Station, this is a... Uh, Six laboratory uh, orbiting station, 250 miles above, above the Earth, uh, wrote, uh, goes around the Earth about every 90 minutes, and it's a, a hospital environment in an inhospitable area. Again, prevention on the International Space Station, just like uh, every other flight, is, is primary. In fact, the astronauts bring their own toothpaste and toothbrush and, and floss with them. Some of them share in a dormitory fashion, but uh, they all basically take care of their teeth. There were no in-flight dental issues aboard uh, the ISS so far, to my knowledge. Still got a long ways to go on that. So what about dental contingency planning for low Earth orbit? Well, all astronauts get semi-annual exams regardless of flight status. At L minus six months, in other words, launch minus six months, that, that's just basically stating six months prior to flight, the astronauts get another complete oral exam. And we want to complete all treatment three months prior to flight. 14 days prior to flight, all crew are quarantined. Nobody really gets to see them unless there's some kind of need for that. And then they do get post-flight exams since all flights are six months and longer right now. So handling dental contingency issues, we do a system called buddy care dentistry. Basically, it's your buddy that's going to be taking care of you. And he might be a vet, might be an engineer. You don't know who you're going to get. You're lucky if you get a flight physician up there anymore right now. What we want is something that can be performed by all crew members. We want to keep it simple. We want to keep it reversible when possible. And always aspiration is a concern. If a crown comes loose, we'll, you know, we want to, uh, you know, have good reason for it to put it back because if it came off, there's a reason why it did. The limitations up there, of course, we got to protect their air and water supply. So VOCs are, are a real problem. We, we cannot bring anything up with any kind of uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, also, medications suffer up there. The harsh environment of space is there's a high radiation um, up there in space flight. And so some of the medications like Augmentin is one in particular that uh, uh, deteriorates quickly. For everything you bring up, you need specialized training. So that's a concern. Stowage is an issue. Also for transport, it requires a thousand pounds of thrust for every pound you want to bring into space. And with that comes a budget. Back when I checked the uh, budget for uh, a pound, uh, for every pound you take up in space flight, it was $10,000 in 1998. And imagine what that's like with today's uh, gas prices right now. So uh, what are some of the potential issues? Uh, trauma is one of them. Uh, even though you don't have weight in space, there's kinetic energy, mass and velocity. So if something, lar a big, large object comes at an astronaut when they're uh, not expecting it, they can traumatize their anterior teeth. Caries is an issue. Even though we take x-rays and do a complete exam on these uh, astronauts, x-ray is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object. And so unless that x-ray beam is parallel to the floor of that restoration, 
you may or may not be detecting all the caries. Infections and inflammation are a concern. I'm going to uh, discuss that later down the road. And there's also bruxism. You know, astronauts do, our type A personalities can have a tendency to clench and brux. And this is kind of a list of the armamentarium they have on board the ISS and was on board the uh, shuttle. Um, they have anesthetic and they have all kinds of instrumentation and, and materials to uh, care for each other. And this is the dental sub pack all packed up. They have a medical checklist, medical sub pack, you know, for medications. And of course, they have medical uh, sub packs as well. Astronauts are trained in anesthetic delivery, temporary filling placement, uh, what to do in case of pulpal exposure, what to do to, you know, whether to re-cement a crown or not, and how to re-cement it antibiotics use, and also to extract, and I'll, I'll describe that later. For anesthetic delivery, they're taught the inferior alveolar, which is the most complex anesthetic uh, method to get right. In fact, some dentists struggle with this as well, and so we spend more time with this. Infiltration works for every other aspect of the oral cavity. Uh, what to do with an exposed vial pulp, uh, anesthetize, extirpate the pulp, place oil of clove uh, and eugenol mixture. This is help soothe that pulp and then monitor the area. For an exposed pulp, sometimes you'll have one where you uh, can break a cusp off and have what's called a dry necrosis. That's an, uh, this little opening down here is where the pulp chamber used to have a vital pulp, but it's, it's a necrotic pulp, been sitting there for a while. And what you'll want to do in a case like this is leave it open and monitor. Usually they'll have no issues as long as that remains open. If you close that up, they could have a gases producing bacteria in there and have further issues. For a lost filling, it's pretty simple. Just explore the floor of the tooth and make sure there's not an open pulp chamber and place a temporary filling material and adjust the bite. Dislodged crown. Uh, if it's not sensitive, we tell the astronaut just to stow it away. There's really no reason to put it back. You know, we'll take care of that when they get back on the ground. If it came loose, there's a reason for it. It either broke somewhere or it just was not prepared properly. And if it is sensitive, they do have calcium, they had calcium hydroxide paste on the shuttle. Currently on the ISS, they have a zinc oxide paste, which works as a good temporary looting material. For dental infections, of course, the first order of care is going to be antibiotics, uh, along with NSAIDs if need be, and then to monitor the tooth. If they're going to be up there for a long period of time, uh, there's two other options, either return to earth early or extraction and monitor. You know, we have not had to have an extraction in space flight, but who knows, it's always good to have those forceps on board. <clears throat> the thing about dental infections that uh, you need to understand is they cannot be resolved with antibiotics alone. Once that pulp chamber becomes ne necrotic, there is no blood supply inside here. And so the bacteria are able to grow freely and without any inhibition. You can take antibiotics all you want, and the only place it's going to treat is around the little bony area down here. It's not going to do anything for what's going on inside that too. And as the bacteria grows, it pushes out into the bone, and that's where they, the patient usually starts feeling pain. One of our major concerns with infections, with lower infections, the uh, bony plate is thinnest on the uh, lingual side. And so Ludwig's angina is always a concern there. For upper infections, you have the infraorbital foramen right here below, below the orbit, and there are no valves preventing infective material to get to the cavernous sinus. That goes directly to the cavernous sinus there, and you could have a much greater problem than just a dental infection. Also, there's a, what's called an acute apical abscess. This is a dental infection that is uh, it's rapid onset and it has a very painful purulent ex exudate. Uh, the patient usually has moderate to severe pain and slight to ve severe swelling. The patient also usually becomes febrile, and the antibiotics in these cases are only temporary. The biggest concern with these is the tooth a lot of times will erupt into what we call a hyperocclusion. So in other words, they cannot bite back down again, and it's very painful every time they touch that tooth. And so you can either put uh, some kind of a wooden uh, stick between their teeth to uh, separate the teeth, uh, but eventually something's going to have to be done and, you know, put them on antibiotics and, and that'll hold them for a little while, but will not be a permanent fix. And that's where the forceps have to be on board. I'm going to talk to you about a dilemma with diagnosing teeth. Multi-rooted teeth, especially teeth that have large restorations, can be in a transient disease state. In other words, you can have one root that is completely vital uh, and the root tests normal. And you can have one root that's also necrotic. 
you can also have another root that's in a chronic state of pulpitis. So that may be a tooth that gives, you know, either no symptoms from the pulpitis or some minor symptoms from the pulpitis. Pulp tests are not that accurate to be able to determine this, and that's a problem. So for space flight, that's always one of uh, our major concerns. Like I say, the pulp test may give mixed results, or they could give no normal results, and you don't know if that tooth is going to be problematic later on. Eventually, what happens with those teeth is they will become necrotic. So pulpitis is basically inflammation in a closed chamber. And it can be in a chronic state or, you know, an, an active state. And in an active state, there's what we call a reversible pulpitis, and that's a uh, pain with stimulus. Uh, usually like cold stimulus will give a little irritation and then it goes away immediately. Once you get into a uh, irreversible pulpitis, as I mentioned before, you can have a chronic state or an acute state. In the chronic state, you really don't know if there's anything going on, but once it gets into an acute state, you have severe paroxysms of pain. It can be localized or diffuse, and so it's very difficult to tell which tooth is the problem. And antibiotics won't usually work in these cases. In fact, they're very difficult to, to anesthetize. Analgesics and narcotics are also usually inadequate. Again, another reason to have forceps on board when you're in space flight. The only treatment for these things are extraction or root canal. So I'm going to get into Artemis. This is the, the, the new and upcoming uh, uh, missions we're having. Phase one was completed in 2022. That was an unmanned orbital mission. This is a combined effort from uh, several nations, the European Space Agency, NASA, and so forth. The manned orbital mission will be coming up in 2023, 20, 2024. We have a Canadian on board. His name is Jeremy Hansen. Then there's Victor Glover. There's also uh, Reed Weissman and Christina Koch. They're all scheduled to fly. In fact, uh, Jeremy Hansen has been waiting a long, long time for a mission. And it just, you know, when he comes in, he goes, you know, he always kind of mentions that, you know, he can't wait to get a mission and so forth. And so he's just ecstatic right now that he finally got this mission. Uh, later on, they plan on having what's called a manned orbital mission, HALO mission. It's, it's uh, the orbit they'll be using. And it's called a manned reticular, lim reticular lim linear uh, HALO orbit. And what this is, they're using the, uh, the gravitational pull of the moon and the gravitational pull of the Earth to get a stable orbit. And it's about uh, 3,000 to 70,000 kilometers in, uh, in, its, in its orbit. And it's a stable 6.5 day orbit that uses minimal fuel. And that's how they're going to be able to achieve this. And so uh, the Orion capsule right now has some pretty significant medical kit limitations. Uh, the total kit, all medical, including dental, is 30 pounds. And you can see this is smaller than a little carry-on suitcase. And so, of course, there's not going to be any forces or elevators for this type of mission. And uh, the current dental kit basically has uh, things for an exposed pole, a lost filling, and a lost crown. And of course, there'll be antibiotics and uh, NSAIDs on board. It, uh, speaking with the flight physicians, they plan to revisit this as the lunar in, uh, uh, duration increases. There's going to be calm delays with ground. It'll be two to five seconds uh, with this new lunar orbit, and uh, they will always have a flight physician where they can communicate with them. Artemis on phase two is going to have what we call uh, the Gateway International Space Station. It's a much smaller space station uh, than the current ISS. In fact, in order to stand up vertically, you have to stand longitudinally within this uh, space station. They do plan to have lunar landings from this and uh, establish a lunar habitat eventually. Some of the concerns for this is uh, mission contingency considerations. To have an early return, it's going to require, instead of uh, three days, as in the original Apollo missions, it's going to require anywhere from seven to 10 days for somebody to get off the lunar surface and get back. So they'll have to revisit that medical and dental kit, of course. Exploration class missions to Mars are going to be a different ballgame altogether. As a matter of fact, the minimum mission they can have is a three-year mission. Uh, there is no re rapid return capability, and there's going to be delayed communications 20 minutes each way. So in other words, they're going to have to be pretty much autonomous. Uh, they have to do a transfer orbit and, you know, and, and have to uh, wait till the uh, two planets align to get back. I believe there's going to be probably some psychological concerns. I don't know, from my perspective, me looking up at Mars and then looking from the lun uh, the Mars surface and seeing the Earth the same size. <laughs> That'll be a consideration for to have some counseling or something. Anyways, uh, they will need advanced uh, training and expanded kits, you know, for this. 
Also, they're probably going to need to incorporate, you know, semi-annual exams and cleanings on their space flights and also on Mars and also computer-based computer procedures or uh, videos. There are some considerations for some of the modern equipment, you know, battery-operated handpiece, handheld x-ray units and so forth, but we'll, you know, determine that as time goes on. This is a um, uh, ambient pressure chamber sim. Uh, pressure chamber in 60 foot of seawater. In other words, what I mean by that is the pressure inside this chamber is the same pressure as there is on the outside for these uh, divers. And Chris Hadfield, one of the Canadian astronauts, is going to show you what happens to uh, gases down here in, at this, uh, at this uh, depth. So anyways, basically what's happening is as you go deeper in, in, under the ocean, so say at 66 feet, for every breath you're taking, every breath you're breathing out of that tank, you're getting three times the gas molecules than you would when you're up on the surface. And so your blood supply distributes this throughout the cells. And so all your cells have absorbed this compressed gas. So you're like a car tire when you're down there. And the only way to release this is for it to circulate back out of your system and then back out through your lungs. So when you dive, you really need to ascend slowly, uh, breathe in and out as you're going up. Up and then make a safety stop to give your body time to release these gases before you make the complete ascension. Otherwise, this is what happens within your cells, and that's where you can suffer uh, these barometric issues. Some of the uh, issues that divers, pilots, and even astronauts during their training suffer are some oral facial, facial pain. One of them is a barotrauma-related headache. Um, another one's barotitis, barosinusitis, dental barotrauma, and barodontalgia. So barodontalgia-related uh, headache is basically irritation of the ethmoid linings of the ethmoid sinus. It affects about 6% of the travelers, and it's usually rated as a six on a one to 10 scale, but it goes away in about 15 to 20 minutes. Barotitis media, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. You can have earache, vertigo, nausea, and hearing loss. Uh, in severe cases, you could get barotitis interna. That's from severe pressure issues. The incidence of this is about 8%. It happens twice as often on descent, one of the uh, diagnosing factors here, than it does on ascent. The pain continues after landings for the pilots and so forth. If you dive or fly, you know, you really should not take any kind of medications and then get caught, especially underwater. Uh, you can get what's called a reverse block if your medication wears off and then you can't get back up again without uh, significant damage to the ears. Barosinusitis, the symptoms of that is a headache, sinus pain, and also dental pain in the posterior, upper posterior teeth. Again, this uh, occurs on descent more often than ascent, and it's about 8% uh, incidence rate. And the, again, another diagnostic feature is pain continues after landing. Now, the thing about barosinusitis, this can be tooth-borne or it can be sinus-borne. And that's where a dentist has to diagnose this out. In the end, you can, you can uh, treat them with antihistamines, but if they're not getting any uh, full results, then a dentist may have to step in and, and uh, diagnose it out. Uh, a lot of times, the way we diagnose uh, barosinusitis is e either off a panoramic x-ray, where you can see here up in the sinus, or on a uh, 3D CBT, CT scan, we can see it here on the image. Dental barotrauma, uh, there's a couple of ways of, uh, uh, a couple of studies have uh, identified this. Uh, one of them terms it odontocrixis, which literally means tooth explosion. It's a little ex uh, extreme here. This is not how it presents. This is a guy that had a good vape on a very bad day, but a more appropriate term for this is called odontoclasis. And what that means is tooth fracture. And that's usually how it presents. They'll be diving or uh, sometimes in flight and they'll feel something, a little bit of pain or something they'll hear a click in their mouth or uh, something loose floating around. And that's what happens is a cusp usually breaks off during their flight. It usually occurs during descent. A lot of divers have experienced this more often than flyers. Some of the concerns are aspiration of the fragments and of course pain when it occurs. You know, it's, it's only short uh, lived usually with the, the dental barotrauma. There's a 10-year uh, longitudinal study done the, by the German Navy and the divers that dove annually about 200 to 300 hours had twice as many crowns uh, placed and also uh, 
had a 25% increase in missing teeth. And that's kind of confirming the uh, barotology or the barot barot barotrauma. There's also a decompression study on uh, extracted teeth. This was done by Calder and Ramsey, where they uh, brought the number of extracted teeth up to 1035 kilopascals over a 12 to 17 hour period. And then over a two minute period, they dropped the pressure down. And what they found was non-restored teeth, including teeth with caries, were not affected. But it, what they showed was poor quality amalgam restorations were the primary source of failure. And what we're finding also with uh, uh, defective amalgams, when you find them with recurrent decay, you remove the amalgam. And if you clean up the bottom of that, the floor of the tooth, there may be asymptomatic cracks underneath. And uh, I find quite frequently that these are uh, the cause of barodontalgia in a lot of cases. Uh, composites, since they're bonded to two structure, a lot of times they'll show up, you know, they'll crack the restoration itself. And as you can see here, uh, this is a, a process called transillumination. And you notice the light comes up to the crack and then stops. And that's how you uh, aid in your diagnosis for that. Barodontalgia is basically dental pain associated with barometric changes in atmospheric pressure. In other words, pain with pressure. And it's, uh, the pain reported is usually 75% 75, 75 in most cases. It can be new induced pain by either, you know, barotrauma, dental barotrauma, or it, odontoclasis, odontocrisis, same, uh, same term, or it can be referred pain. But it's usually, and that's that's from a barosinusitis or otitis media, but it's usually a case of pre-existing subclinical oral disease. Remember how, what I was telling you about the, uh, the diagnostic dilemma of teeth, that uh, sometimes you can have teeth that you don't know that there's a problem existing, and it, it happens to be there. I say the pulp tests are not that effective. Uh, so you're basically going from asymptomatic pathology to symp symptomatic pathology. One thing you need to know, recent treatment may be the probable cause. Uh, there's a 30% chance if they had recent treatment on that same side, it, it, it may be related, that may be the cause of barodontalgia. Also, incomplete root canal treatment could be a possible cause. Apical abscess or cyst. A pulp cap tooth, pulpal necrosis, dentinal cracks, as I showed you earlier, deep restorations, periodontal abscess, reversible or irreversible pulpitis, dentinal caries, especially around existing restorations. And remember what I told you about multiple rooted teeth. Virgin Sick and his study found that 86% were due, it was uh, baritontalgia cases were due to faulty restorations. Again, this is what you look for. You'll see little cracks in the tooth. You'll see some dark areas around the existing restoration, which is usually caries. Uh, diagnosis becomes so much more important. You want to know the type of pain, whether it's sharp or dull. Uh, the first four of these are what's going to really give you 90% of your diagnosis. The type of pain, the event, whether it is ascent or descent, uh, the location of pain, upper or lower teeth, uh, and does it linger? Once you know those, you've pretty got uh, most of your diagnosis right there, and I'm going to show you here in just a minute. And there's also, you want to know the intensity of pain, the altitude of depth that occurred, if you can get that from them, depends on whether they're a pilot or not. Any previous symptoms, they had problems with it before, did they have recent dental treatment, and also did they have any recent cold flu or sinus issues. So the first pulp test was done for you. That was actually the change in pressure. So after that, you ask questions. If you get your questions uh, answered, from there, you can run your pulp tests and locate the, the offending tooth. Again, you want to look for faulty restorations, recurrent decay, deep or large restorations, a cracked dental structure, pulp cap teeth, and apical lesions. Remember, recent treatment, there's a 30% chance that may be the culprit. Uh, it takes about 48 to 72 hours for the teeth to heal, and uh, you want to check occlusion. And, of course, you want to rule out barosin barosinusitis and barotitis uh, media. So this is uh, the FDI classifications. Uh, class 1, during ascent, it's usually a sharp, sharp momentous pain, and during uh, descent, it's usually asymptomatic thereafter. And you, that tells you uh, it's pretty much a vital tooth and maybe carries a defective restoration. And if you look on a radiograph, there won't be any apical pathology, and that's determined to be acute pulpitis. Uh, class 2 is dull throbbing pain as opposed to sharp pain, and that can be a vital or non-vital tooth. But it, again, it's usually deep caries, restoration, and so forth. 
and that's usually chronic pulpitis. Class three, this is where you're getting into possible uh, sinusitis or otitis, but also it's a non-vital tooth, deep caries, periapoptosis, and so forth. And then class four is severe persistent pain, and that usually has to do with a periapical cyst and so forth. This is uh, something I've put together that just kind of simplifies the diagnostic process. It's accurate in 99% of the cases. If, a if pain occurs during ascent, you're looking for a vital tooth. It's usually a pulpitis. If there was recent treatment, it'll be a sharp transient pain. Also, if it's acute, it'll be a sharp transient pain. If it's chronic, it's a dull throbbing pain. And then periodontal abscess also can have a dull throbbing pain. If it occurs during, the pain occurs during descent, you're looking for a dead tooth. And this is, uh, it'd be periapical disease or cyst, pulpal necrosis, referred pain from uh, sinusitis or otitis. And this is what you look for. Radiographically, for a scent, a live vital tooth, there's going to be no apical lesion. Your cold and heat tests are usually positive. Your uh, percussion and palpation tests, usually negative. And you can suspect pulpitis or periodontal abscess is also uh, one of the things you'd be looking for. Uh, for descent dead, these usually linger. Radi radiographically, there usually will be a periapical lesion. Uh, cold test is usually negative. Percussion test is usually positive, and then you can suspect pulpal necrosis, apical cyst, or referred pain. And then, uh, of course, descent, you can have referred pain. Barosinusitis will usually refer pain to the upper posterior teeth, and otitis will refer pain to the lower posterior teeth. I'm going to take you back in time just reviewing some studies and so forth. And back in the 1940s, I just want to show you some history here. It was the term for it, because this was occurring during flight, was aerodontalgia, okay? And it was ranked fifth in in-flight physiological complaints of the uh, U.S. pilots, and it was ranked third as the causative factor in premature landings. In fact, the greatest body research was done during this period. Healthy pulps, they found, were not affected. They found the primary causes, again, are defective restorations and covert pre-existing pulpal disease. And of course, Barrison sinusitis and, uh, can also be a culprit in this also, and that's where you have to make the determination. The reports back then were 10% military, 11% civilian for in-flight baritontalgia. In fact, one of the greatest studies that was done back then by Orban uh, and Ritchie, they took 75 symptomatic teeth that they extracted in a barometric chamber and then had them uh, prepared and then compared them to 210 other extracted teeth that were not in a barometric chamber. And they found that symptomatic pulps had inflammatory cells and gas voids. So they had a symposium in 1946 at the Chicago uh, Midwinter Meeting. And it was a symposium on the problems of aviation dentistry. And their findings were the incidence rate was 9.7%. And it was due to undiagnosed pulpal and apical pathology. And what they stated is aviation dentistry, this is their parting statement, will not only be part of clinical practice, but research in its many phases will affect everyday dental procedures. Well, that didn't happen. So why not? What happened basically is there were some controlled group studies that were done, and it was a small number of simulated flights over a short period of time, one to two weeks. And the incidence rates reported then were 0.26 to 3.0, which is pretty insignificant. And if you take cancer and uh, heart disease, and if you did it over the same method, you'll find the incidence rates are very low as well. So since 1940s, what has changed? Well, airline cabins right now are pressurized, so that should reduce baritontalgia. Dental materials and techniques have improved. We would think that would also reduce baritontalgia. However, flights have grown exponentially, and scuba diving is now an everyday event. So if you put all that together, you're going to have high numbers again, and awareness and diagnosis in this field has declined. So since the 1940s, what has not changed? The percentages, the averages are still 11%. In fact, one study boasts 49.6%. That's almost 50%. In fact, there's a report of a higher incidence in pressurized cabins. Now, why is that? Well, modern airline cabins hold a pressure of about 7,000 feet. It only requires 2,000 feet for baritontalgia to occur. 
one of the recent journals from the Aerospace Medical Association had a study done by the French Federation of Underwater Sports, and they surveyed 684 divers. And in their findings, they were finding barodontalgia at 18.7% and bar dental barrel uh, uh, trauma, odontocrexis or odontoclasis, at uh, 10.1%. What about astronauts? Do they deal with barometric issues? They do. It's in their training. They, they, they'll they they'll come to me, you know, and tell me they had a toothache when they were diving or flying and so forth. The incidence rate for that is about 7.4% during training. They have not suffered any cases during flight. They've had some otitis cases and so forth, but uh, not any barodontalgia cases as of such. Uh, and these are some of the preventive protocols they've used. They've used several, especially on the uh, ISS and the shuttle. They've, they've gone through uh, several different ones, but uh, these are the main ones that they've used. Here's some dental considerations. This is both for medicine and dentistry. Any dental procedures requiring anesthetic, pilots are on a self-grounding note to not dive or fly for 12 to 24 hours. And it varies, you know, so, uh, different uh, branches of the service have different uh, numbers for that, but it's a self-grounding notification. Uh, my question to you, uh, if they go off and fly regardless and something happens, do we have some kind of responsibility as to have informed them or not? So it's, it's something to keep uh Keep in mind, you know, also analgesics other than aspirin and acetaminophen, there should be no flying or diving for a minimum of 12 hours. Another self-grounding notice. Antihistamines, no flying or diving for 24 hours after ces cessation of treatment. Uh, diving, diphenhydramine is 60 hours. Antibiotics, there should be a 24-hour period for them to make sure there's not going to be a, any abdominal stress. For dentistry, uh, pulp caps are, you know, frowned upon uh, for, you know, pilots and, and divers and so forth. In fact, some studies show that they're contraindicated and others say it should be avoided. Uh, and in fact, you should err on the side of uh root canal treatment. And the reason is the risk of barodontalgia, pulpitis, and infection. Endodontic procedures, you shouldn't fly or dive until treatment is completed and symptoms subside. As far as surgery, there should be no flying or diving for a period of about seven days. And they should be re-examined prior to flying. You know, make sure there's no, uh, there's a stabilized clot. You know, all symptoms have subsided. If there is an oral antral communi communication suspected, there should be a, uh, no flying or diving for a period of two weeks, and then referral for closure. This is the case, uh, Alder reported, where he had a case during training where a periapical abscess burst in flight resulting in long-term hospitalization. The real kicker in this case, though, is this occurred in a pressurized cabin. Uh, the cements that we choose also makes a difference. Uh, they found that zinc phosphate has a 90% reduction in retention. Glass ionomer has a 50% reduction in retention. And resin uh, cements had no reduction in retention. So for anybody going on space flight, highly recommend using a resin cement. What do all the studies suggest, right? The, these studies suggest that dentists need to be educated and aware of these conditions. And I'm going to uh, inform you, <clears throat> dentists currently are not being educated in this fashion right now as far as barometric conditions. And uh, we're slowly evolving that way, but uh, currently there's, there's an issue there. And now we've got something new coming on. It's called the commercial space industry. NASA and, you know, ESA and uh, uh, the Russian cosmonauts are all taken care of by a dentist, a flight physician, and so forth. But the commercial space industry is totally different. Pa patients or people that have a lot of money are the ones that are able to fly, and they may not have necessarily seen a dentist. Uh, these are some of the commercial space companies that are out there that are promoting space flight for the um, people that have money. And so, you know, with space tourism, it's on the rise. I'm telling you, you know, people want to go see the Aurora Borealis. What better way to see it? you got much greater chances. And, you know, you can see it from above and, and also, you know, the earth from below. So these are space touring companies, just strictly for touring, just a list of those. And uh, the, the first company that was made was uh, Space Adventures. And one of the masterminds behind this was Richard Garriott. It was uh, Owen Garriott's, one of the uh, Skylab astronauts' son. And he made his wealth uh, designing uh, video games and uh, decided he wanted to buy his weight into space. Well, he ended up selling his seat to Dennis Tito, but eventually got to fly in space uh, uh, seven flights later. So Dennis Tito was our first space tourist.
some of the space touring companies, Blue Origin, Zero to Infinity, Virgin Galactic, Worldview Enterprises. These are all high altitude suborbital space flights. Then you have the commercial space industry with Axiom Space, which is currently making space station modules for the ISS. And they eventually plan on taking over the ISS for the commercial industry when they're through with it. And Bigelow uh, Aerospace is also uh, developing some inflatable space stations. And you got Axiom Space, which, like I say, was building those modules. They're currently also having space tourism. They'll go up for six weeks. AX-1 went up with Michael Lo uh, Lopez Alegria, one of the uh, prior astronauts, as the commander back in 2022. And this month, we should have uh, Commander Peggy Whitson leading the next group up. SpaceX, uh, of course, is uh, transporting astronauts to and from the space station now. They bring up supplies. They also delivered the first cappo cappuccino machine uh, to the ISS. And as you know, where good coffee is, people are going to gather. So uh, that's, you know, something that's uh, getting ready to happen with the uh, tourism. It's just going to get bigger and bigger. They also have their own uh, civilian tourism where they've sent people up for Inspiration4 crew. Uh, Jared Isaacman uh, brought along Haley, Crisp, and Sian. I just want to show you this video to kind of give you an idea of how this space industry is uh, growing. This is a video that I, I spotted that's over a 12-year period for SpaceX. And just kind of watch this and see what happens. Speaks for itself. And I know Australia has already approved some additional spaceports. So, I mean, you're going to be probably seeing a lot of that going on in your area as well. SpaceX, I don't know if you know this or not, they've already sold two circumlunar flights. One is an entrepreneur, Yusaka Mazawa, and he's got his uh, eight artists he's going to bring. And then uh, the second one is Dennis Tito and his wife, Akiko. They plan to do the second flight and they have an additional uh, two dozen seats. So if you happen to know them, you might want to communicate with them. So anyways, like I say, with the commercial space industry, these are people that just have a lot of money and can afford space flight. There are companies like Axiom and, and so forth that are doing things responsibly, but what the future is going to hold, I don't know. And so dentists need to be aware of the problems that can occur for space flight, as well as physicians. And so we're able to, to be able to diagnose and treat these people effectively because they're going to have more problems than your standard astronauts are. They need to be able to examine, diagnose, treat effectively. If you want to, to get a hold of uh, and learn more, there's the International Association of Aerospace Dentistry. Uh, they're an affiliate of the Aerospace Medical Association. Uh, they have a website that you can go to and they present on aerospace dentistry. They have panels just about every year, but not this year, unfortunately. Uh, the Aerospace Medical Association Association is another good source to get information if you want any information to share with you. And of course, preventive dentistry, my strongest one here is uh, don't leave home without it. So I want to thank you. I've got a list of references at the end of this. So if you want to review some of the references, by all means, please do. And thank you for having me. It's an honor to speak to your group. And uh, I wish you all the best in your careers and uh, best wishes. Thank you. Thank you so much. That that was absolutely awesome. And I love, love the way that you covered the whole history. And there's so much that we can learn from history. And it's really interesting that some of the lessons that they were discovering back in the 1940s, that you can still carry that forward to today and that the same basic principles are, are still still there and still very important to take note of. I really, really enjoyed it. I learned heaps. It was incredibly valuable and very, very grateful that you took time out of your evening to come along and talk to us today. So thank you again. Fantastic presentation.
Thank you so much, Dr. Christensen. Any further questions or anything I can... I just on? had one question, and that was when I was a, a child, those sort of metallic-looking amalgam fillings were very, very common, and uh -huh. you've mentioned them quite a few times through the presentation. I was wondering, are they still commonly used as fillings, or have they been replaced by these newer... They, it depends. You know, there's, there's a lot of dentists that that have eliminated amalgam fillings from their practice, but they are still taught in the schools and they are still placed today. Amalgam fillings, they are not a bad restoration. They, they are strong, but they do have some faults. Every restoration does. Uh, composites, uh, the tooth color restorations are, they're very difficult to place correctly. And so a dentist that wants to go to uh, doing a composite restoration has to really study it and practice it to where they can finally place those things effectively and make them strong. There's a lot of little, lot of little uh, details, attention to details you have to do to do those things correctly. And then there's also indirect restorations like golden and porcelain and that kind of stuff. And, and every restoration has its pluses and minuses. And uh, But I am finding that there are, you know, you can find just about any amalgam restoration you pull out. Now, I'm not saying all, but most of them you pull out, you will find some small micro cracks underneath and so forth. Uh, a lot of times they can have a tooth that's dead and not know it. Other times they can have a crack there that's not affecting the pulp at all. It's just a very quiescent crack. And when you pull out that decay and, and the amalgam, you find it and you know it's time to put a crown on it. But there are a lot of my baritontology cases that come to me when I remove the uh, defective restoration, once I've diagnosed the tooth, that's what I usually find. And a lot of those you can just put a crown on, but some, of course, you might need to do a root canal on as a preventive measure. But, uh, and, you know, the amalgams, like I say, they do have a property to them. It's called creep. And what that is, is over time, the pressures can cause that amalgam filling to compress and expand and, and push out on that tooth a little bit. It's like glass. When you see a glass window that's very old, you'll notice it's much thicker at the bottom. Uh, amalgam is kind of similar to that. It's never fully hard. It's uh, close to hard, but never quite full. And so whenever you uh, put pressure on it, it does uh, compress a little bit. Not a lot, but a little. Well, that's it's really fascinating. Yeah, I've sort of found found that about when people talk about glass in ancient cathedrals and how that that changes over over time. So that makes a lot of sense. And sorry, I just had one one more question. That amazing laser technology that you were, were showing that provides much better results in terms of identifying defects. How widely is that available and used at the moment? It's it's becoming more and more. It's being used more and more uh, since since the technology's come out. It came out about uh, 19, no, it wasn't 19, so it's in 2000, actually. It's about, uh, I'd say probably about 2010. And so it's very easy to, to get a hold of and, and use. In fact, a lot of practices just bought up a bunch of them. The nice thing about it is it does not use radiation. And so especially for your pedodontic patients and so forth, that's really a, a nice feature. The, the downside to that one is it has to have a little rubber piece that sits on either side of the tooth and along the gum line. And sometimes there can be some tender areas along the gum line where you got to be really cautious. And then second of all, that uh, what I've found with it, it works very well for detecting cavities, caries, and approximately about as far down as halfway down the tooth. After that, you really need to air dry the tooth and look very well, you know, uh, with a mirror and an explorer. And then also radiographs also shine better for once they're further down and the tooth closer to the gum line, you know, more than halfway down to the gum line. But uh, it's, it's a, um, yeah, it's a, a nice uh, instrument to have. It's an, a good adjunct. Yeah. And radiographs still, still play their role. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's sort of wonderful to know about all these new technologies and what's what's out there. And so thank you again. It was really wonderful. I really enjoyed it and um, lovely to see you. All right, Dr. Christensen, you have a wonderful evening or morning, I guess, which would be for you. <laughs> yes, so well, enjoy the rest of your evening. And thanks. Thanks again. It was really fantastic. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye for now. Goodbye. Thank you.